Welcome, listeners, to www.ironradio.org, the website and podcast for all things strength sports and sports nutrition. With your hosts, Lonnie Lowry. Remember, Phil is like a gnarled old oak tree held together with scar tissue and bone spurs. Rob Fortney. And I'm telling you, the pain that I would suffer was ex- beyond excruciating. And Phil Stevens. Do it, Rob. Like, You'll kill all those nerves. Thanks for listening. Welcome, Iron Radio listeners. This is Lonnie Lowry. I'm an exercise physiology and sports nutrition professor of about 20 years, and I'm a former competitive bodybuilder. Hey, this is Phil Stevens. I run Strength Guild. I'm a strength coach. Powerlifting, weightlifting, highland games, all that stuff. Hey, it's Dr. Mike T. Nelson, faculty member of the Kerrig Institute, creator of the Flex Diet Certification, a bunch of other stuff. And I'm actually at home getting ready to do a seminar at my place for two days right after this. Right on. Yeah. All right. Uh, we are going to have a mail and news episode. Everyone is just backing up on us. Uh, and we have a guest coming next week uh, to talk about starting your own supplement company. So um, let's get to it. This first one is from Chris. Chris says, um, hi, guys. Uh, I'm on the list with the coffee trial and taste test. Uh, I'm always trying to get control on the taste of coffee. Some brands are definitely better than others. I think body chemistry must affect it. Um, The reason is I've tried so many different coffees as well as brew methods. What I find is that coffee tastes better some days than others pretty much regardless. Uh, Do you have any idea? I hope you figure it out. Um, (laughs) The only thing I can can suggest, Chris, is that there is a ton of uh, information coming out these days, and our listeners already know this through our news sections, but... On the microbiome, it's not just in your gut. You have a mouth biome, you know, bacteria populations in your mouth, even in your beard. uh, We've talked about in the past, which they, you know, they suspect affects like why men with beards might get less colds or you know that sort of thing. Um, So that's all I can really say. And not only that, I think we got to get away from this old map of you know that tongue map, like sweet at the tip of your tongue and bitter at the back and salty on the sides or you have these receptors more or less throughout your mouth. Uh, I, I'm not saying that they're not concentrated in those areas in some people, but it could be individually different. You know, so it's there's even a genetic trait for super tasters. So when you hear someone talk about the oaky quality in wine, you know, or the peatiness uh, of some nice brown liquor, <laughs> they might be super tasters, right? Or they can detect things that the rest of us can't. So there's a lot going on here with the microbiome uh, of your mouth, uh, with your t- taste buds, taste receptors, all that kind of stuff. Um, but I, I want to take the opportunity here to let everyone know uh, we haven't forgotten that taste testing trial. There was a breakthrough this last week. It's boring. I'm not going to tell you why, but we can't move forward without the okay from certain people. So if you signed up, and I know some people got put on a wait list because there's too many, but... Look for an NDA to be emailed to you, a non-disclosure agreement that I need you to sign and take a picture with your cell phone and return by email to me. There's also going to be like a hold harmless form, essentially just a liability form. This is, I understand, I'm consuming a special, you know, um, way of brewing coffee uh, and that sort of thing. So there's a, a release form and an NDA. Print them off. Take a picture with your cell phone. Email them back. And, and we'll get started. It's pretty much that easy at this point, finally. So uh, I'm, look, I'm looking forward to that, too, because I want to make sure that the, what we're doing here doesn't taste funny. So there's that. The next one um, is training-related. This is from Andrew. He says, um, sorry if this isn't a normal channel for sending questions, uh, but I don't use Facebook often enough, so I thought I would just email well, first off, Andrew, bless your heart, because I am on board with you, brother. Um, I <laughs> cannot live on Facebook. It's creepy that our entire society gets pumped through Facebook, so I prefer email. Anyway, he says, I think I have a good question for you guys to cover. How does your lifting change when you can't get quality sleep? Uh, I asked because my wife just had our second kid, and solid sleep just isn't going to happen. 
<laughs> not for a while. Um, mm-hmm. I'd love to hear what you think. As always, your podcast stands above the rest in quality. Andrew. All right, Phil. <laughs> yeah. uh, you just need to you just need to understand for about two years you're just not going to get much sleep um at least that's how we were yeah, it was about a year and a half you know once the fine baby finally starts sleeping all the way through then it gets a little better but um yeah and i mean i just adjusted my training to fit that you know i would come in with a plan but i do this anyways i come in with a plan but I, it's always not set in stone it's pretty liquid you know, mm-hmm. so it's like, okay, if it was feeling good that day, then I'd do my plan. But if it's not, then I back off and I don't feel bad about it. You know, I just hit what's there. You know, if that's 80% of what I had planned, that's fine. I still know that's better than doing some training is better than not. You know what I'm saying? I mean, like even last weekend I had, I don't know, I just had a cold going on, didn't get very good sleep. The week prior, I'd hit 605 for five on squat. I was going for heavy three, and I only got to 550. And it was like, oh, I'm done. I have no energy. I could have went up, but it had been stupid too. Mm -hmm. So I know that 550 for three, even though it's less than 605 for five, it's still, I'm not going to go backwards for doing that. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? So um, life happens. When life happens, you got to kind of, uh, Dan John talks about that a lot, about the whole, you've got your, your life's made up of one pie. And if this piece gets bigger, the other ones have to get a little smaller because you can only handle so much stress. So mm-hmm. your your training stress needs to get a wee bit smaller for now. So Yeah. You can only pour so much caffeine on the problem. Yeah. You know. So. Yeah. I mean, yeah. don't get me wrong. It's helpful. Yeah. <laughs> it can be just, helpful. A little ibuprofen just, and caffeine to get you through the day. <laughs> you know. You're but, gonna have, he's going to have some days that are still good. You know. <laughs> but, I mean – be okay with it, you know, is the main thing. It's just, honestly, it's mentally that. It's just being okay with, eh, okay days. You know, you're, you're not going to have a lot of those killer days right now. Go in, punch the clock, get your 30, 45 minutes in or whatever you can you can handle and get out and know that you're still going to make progress in a, in a year and a half, two years from now when things are really settled down again and you got, uh, you can you can push it hard again. So You know, I'm going to self-disclose something. I'm never going to live it down, but I'm going to be honest. When um, my son Logan was a baby, uh, my wife will never let me live this down. She still throws it up to me. But <laughs> I was so strung out from getting like four hours a night for weeks on end, you know, like spotty. Maybe you get six and a half one night. You get three another, and you know, that kind of stuff. I said, screw this. I'm going to a hotel. I, I mean, I was, I was just done. You know, I couldn't work out. I was falling apart. And, you know, and in some ways it sounds – this sounds a little sexist, but I think women can handle that kind of thing a little better than men do. I don't know. I could be wrong. I, I don't have any science to back that up, but I, I'm like, I, I have to sleep. I, I need one yeah. night of, you know, oh. six or eight hours of sleep, and I, I'm just like, I'm out of here. No, I never really did it, but to this day, right, she, she, she points to me that day, like, you know, oh, you can't yeah. take it, you know. <laughs> I, don't act tough to me. <laughs> no, I, yeah. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. My wife took the brunt of the damage. I mean, our little boy was breastfed, so when he'd wake up crying, not much dad can do. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> you know, so, but, uh, you know, by far she had it worse than me. But, uh, yeah, it's just, it's rough. I mean, it's part of, you You probably chose to have a kid, so. <laughs> you yeah, and you know what? And if you're going to, it might be wise maybe not to have, um, a bucket list competition in that period yeah. you know if you can't train well or things it's sort of similar with work sometimes you know it just it's it's life and some people it's funny I remember Franco Colombo used to say that when he was studying for his chiropractic exams and all that kind of stuff and I mean that's its own story but he liked the idea that he was training for something it 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 was a, a pressure valve like you know release for him but other people it's it's folly you know, because it's a good point. You lower your overtraining threshold massively. You know, in other words, you can much more easily overdo it, end up hurt, exhausted, whatever. So some people thrive on that and they need some training to deal with it. Other people, maybe you don't want to, um, you know, have that big competition. Um, I don't know. It, it, it is. It's just tough. So. Uh, Diet-wise, I would suggest you're probably a poor carbohydrate metabolizer, but again, just playing around in some of the advanced uh, exercise phys classes with uh, students, 
very fit students, as we talked about in past weeks, you, it's hard to knock them out of homeostasis badly. So uh, we have a pretty good idea, though, that chronically poor sleep, you're, you're not that good of a carbohydrate metabolizer. So I don't know, maybe switch over to healthy fats a little bit more, something like that. But um, again, very if you're very fit, yeah, you know, it, maybe it all just comes out in the wash. Yeah, I also just found that if you know, I don't have any kids, but when I was doing my PhD and working and all that kind of stuff, or even now once in a while with travel and everything else, like a couple of things I found that if you have a period of a week where you're just really wrecked for whatever reason. Yeah, you know, still try to go to the gym, but like Phil said, if it's not there, then don't push it. Um, that was me like this week. I even was ready to squat yesterday, had everything ready to go, and I just ended up going for a walk instead. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. then I also went to bed at 8 o'clock. So I'm like, if if it's not there, then I haven't really earned the right to stay up and do something else till 10 or 11 because then I'm just going to be even farther behind. Um, so people are really busy. I like them to... Like Lonnie was saying, make sure the rest of their nutrition, everything else is more on point because you just don't have as much wiggle room. And then I actually like higher frequency. So even if you can only get like a half hour or you can put a kettlebell in your garage or a barbell or, or something you can get access to, trying to do something every day. That way, if that day is good, you know, maybe you have a little time, you can expand it out a little bit from there. And consequently, if it just doesn't feel like it at all, then just walk away from that session, you know, as opposed to people who try to schedule, you know, one or two sessions a week, and if something happens, they're just really more likely mentally to push it when it's not there, as opposed to, hey, it's okay, I got tomorrow, I can do it, or the next day. I think it just kind of takes some of that pressure away. And like Dan John was saying, you can get in a lot more just really simple, easy, kind of punch the clock, you know, training sessions, which... The consistency of it will definitely still add up over time. You know, Mike, now that you say that, um, the past oh three weeks, that's kind of what I'm doing. My training log, I only write down when I go to the gym, like what I do when I yeah. go to Pep's gym down in Bodybuilders. But um, I thought, what was the advice? Because I've been, work has been just eating me alive, you know, with so many different things going on. So for those of you listeners who have weights at home, um, I've been doing kind of what you're saying, Mike. It's less exhausting for me to go down and do, I'll literally just put like two and a quarter on the bar and do a, you know one or two sets of squats. Maybe later in the day yeah. I might do some pulls or something like that. And I'm trying to do that whenever I kind of think about just going downstairs. You know, So over the course of the week, I still might get in eight sets for a, a major muscle group or something like that, if that makes any sense. And yeah, there's no one exhausting workout that I just don't have the resources to deal with. You know, so yeah, we ended up putting a rower in our garage, which has been great. So, like, you know, three days this past week, I got up and said, Okay, I'm just gonna first thing in the morning, I'm just gonna do an easy nasal breathing 2K. Not that far, not that demanding, but you know, over time, you know, three days of that, I've already rode 6,000 meters, right? Not a ton, but more than what I did the previous week. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <clears throat> you know, this is um. It's reminiscent, Phil, of what you, you've said in the past about I don't care how many sets it takes to, to get to X number of reps, uh, yeah. get this total dose of iron. I mean, the rep is yeah. the building block, you know, and it's kind of that idea. If you can get in, like I said, eight sets, but let's say that's, I don't know, 50 or 60 reps, I still got some kind of total dose of iron, mm -hmm. quote unquote, during the week. Yeah, you know, so. I mean, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I mean, my, my little boy turned three in June. And up until about May, I was getting all my training in, my real training, on one day a week. Wow. You know, it was Saturdays. That was like, oh, that's Dad's day. You know? Yeah. <laughs> and I'd forget a little bit here and there while I was at the gym coaching, but you guys know it's yeah, almost busy. impossible. It's almost yeah. impossible to train and coach. So I'd pick up a dumbbell and do a couple rows, whatever. Yeah. You know? Yep, exactly. But it wasn't training. And the ability to walk away is... Something that is learned in time. Because all you hear is like, oh, don't be a pussy. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah, right. It's it's learning when you're not. <laughs> you know, am I, am I being a pussy or am I walking away and being smart? And because yeah, my guys will look at me like last week. Yeah, like last week when I, I just called her, I was like, no, I'm done. I know I did enough. <laughs> and I'm going to be stupid if I go higher. So, 
I'll come back and get it this week, and I feel great today. So yeah, and you know, any listener, if if you're a rank beginner, this is playing with fire, frankly, right? I mean, you got to remember we're pretty familiar with what's, you know. Listen, I really don't have it versus yeah. just lacking mm-hmm. discipline. If you're kind of yes. tired, if you look back, mm-hmm. you're like, oh, I'm eating okay, I'm sleeping okay. Well, get your ass in the gym. <laughs> yeah. But if you're if you have a solid, documentable reason. You know why you, it's just not there, or it could just be infectious, right? Like yeah. a cold or something. Mm-hmm. Um, you just you have to learn to be honest with yourself, and sometimes that's a hard call. I, I mean, yes, I know yes. you guys can agree with that. Like, I'm I kind of have a head cold. Is is this going to justify me changing my workout or not going in? You know what I mean. Everybody wrestles with that a little, mm-hmm. I think. So it, it just takes yeah. some experience. And that's why I'm a big fan of using some outside metrics like heart rate variability or even body temp or respiration or something that's measured each day. Because even like Tuesday, I came back from travel. I was going to do an upper body session. My HRV was crap. But I'm like, meh, historically, I've done some light stuff and it's been okay. So I went to the gym. It was okay. It wasn't the greatest session ever. But HRV wasn't better the next day, but it wasn't any worse. So I'm like, okay, so that probably was the right call you know if it tanks by 15 points and i'm like nope that wasn't the right call at all (laughs) yeah but you only learn that by experience and testing it out yeah yeah and you know i'll tell you uh, i was talking about the resiliency of of uh especially if you're young um i haven't in my experimenting just over the past few months with hrv i can't knock people barely even down into the into the mid 80s on a, on the HRV scale. I don't know if it's genetic or what, but or maybe I, I just have a lot of kids that you know they just take for granted maybe they are sleeping eating properly, you know, but I'm not seeing huge differences in HRV it seems like. So, I don't know. Yeah. Um I've seen some people that even though their nutrition is not the best, their stress management is okay. They just seem to be lack of a better word more resilient than other people. Um, Even in response to different types of training, I've seen some people where low rep training, man, they can go to the gym almost every day and do some form of low rep training and be okay. They're definitely the exception. Um, But I've seen other people that get wrecked by volume, you know, and other people that respond well to volume. Yeah. And looking at them on paper, I don't know. They look really darn similar. (laughs) Mm -hmm. I do love the idea, though. Uh, Anytime you can get like you said, objective measures. I love the idea of continuous monitoring, right, of something that's yeah. not just subjective. Don't get me wrong. The per-client or per-patient subjective stuff is also fantastic, you know, because yeah, ultimately your context. perceptions matter. But I love the objective stuff. I've been looking into the continuous glucose monitoring um, yeah, devices. Yeah, fascinating. Um, yeah, 14 days. Yeah, that's right. Just in July, they approved, Abbott got approved for the, uh, what is it, the Libre Freestyle, freestyle Libre. Yeah, 14 or whatever, yeah. yeah. And so I'm, I think I'm going to start playing with those uh, in the lab a little bit. Uh, you need a prescription to get those listeners, but, and, I mean, I guess it, unless you're a science nerd, uh, you're doing it for research purposes. But anyway, yeah, HRV, glucose responses, subjective feelings of how motivated you are to get in the gym or your hunger or your sleep, there are things you should be recording, I think. So maybe that will help. <laughs> our strung out friend here <laughs> so yeah and last part of the super simple one if you don't have any technology is i tell clients just go to the gym and go through and you've documented your warm-ups before in the past add in a few more warm-ups and if you get like phil was saying towards your your top set or your goal and it's just not there okay now your option is to do something different or if you really feel horrible then just go home but oh, most of the time when you're new, you won't have that experience. Mm-hmm. You won't know until you actually go in and test it. Because you'll have days that you feel horrible and turn out to be pretty damn good. You mm-hmm. know, so it's hard to predict it without any experience. Yeah. I mean, that's what I've been at long enough. I know what any specific weight should feel like. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, I can tell you by a couple of plates on the road, oh, it's going to be a good day. <laughs> yeah, it's flying so, up. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And, and things just feel good. So, you know, that's where one of those... Um, and again, I know you're, Mike, you were just saying not technology based, but the velocity based training can yeah, be very handy for device. that. Right? Because if, yeah. you're, if you're very fresh, you're like, woo, that bar is going like 1.2 yeah. meters you know, per second or something like that instead of, um, oh man, I'm, that usual weight that I can move really fast, I'm now pushing like 0.85 meters per second. It's just, 
the speed's not there, mm-hmm. something's off. So even the velocity stuff can is is neat. And I know you've been playing with some, yeah, like consumer based, like more portable stuff than the stuff that I have in the lab. So yeah, and the push device for that is is pretty good. We used that in the Carrig Human Performance Program last weekend, and it's super useful. A little bit of learning um, with it, but yeah, velocity based predictions, especially of one RM. Um, Prediction wise is pretty good. You know, it's not 100% accurate, but it's pretty darn good. And having that at least be calibrated to you once in a while so you know what a speed is is helpful. Right. The force velocity relationship is age old, right? Beautiful little yeah. classic graph. Yeah. And yeah, if you're not moving the weight fast, it's nice to have a little number on it. Like, no, that doesn't just feel slower. That is slower. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, maybe something's off. So, um, all right. I have one more. Uh, before we go to break, and after the break, we'll do all of the the news. But one more mail. This is from Karen. She says, "I eagerly await your lambasting of this pop science article." The one she uh, sent the link to was from Gizmodo.co.uk, uh, and it was entitled "No Such Thing as Too Much Exercise Study Finds." So, mm-hmm. um, I looked at this, uh, Karen, and I just serendipitously had a colleague come and talk to me uh, about this as well. Uh, and there seems to be different perceptions. And I think it's the, this is what happens when you get some of these quote unquote science journalists, they get a hold of something um, insofar as they're pointing to the same thing. I mean, there was a uh, study that came out of the Cleveland Clinic, uh, which is very near my, my home here. And it suggested that for epidemiological reasons, just general lifestyle trends. It wasn't causal or anything like that. They're just kind of looking at population-based stuff. The more people exercised, uh, the less like total mortality they had or the less cardiac mortality they had. Uh, I, I, the, answer, the short answer to this, when, Karen, when you say lamb-based, the, you know, this idea, it's – it's what the journalists are doing or what the lay public is not considering, which is population specificity, right? In the gen pop, yeah, probably more is better. You know, if John Smith goes for a run four times a week instead of two or three, probably better off, right? What they are not doing, and I think what this gets bastardized to be, is literally there's no such thing as overtraining, and you'd have to be adult to think that, mm. right? <laughs> Um, but so, in other words, they are not looking at hard training, in training, competitive powerlifters and bodybuilders, because we all know sympathetic overtraining is real, you know, and it takes a toll. And that, and a lot of the same devices and methods we just mentioned for not getting enough sleep, um, whether it's HRV, bar velocity, uh, glucose measurements, whatever it is, subjective things like eagerness to train, those things also go down if you have too much intensity times volume, right? So, uh, Phil, what about, what's your input on this? Uh, again, because I think this got twisted into literally there's no such thing as yeah. too much exercise. And maybe you could compare the gen pop versus well, I mean, your crowd. I can crowd. tell you this, 90% of the time, when I am taking, when I have a, a lifter that's, say, advanced, and they want to go to the elite stage, 99% of the time it's me getting them to do less. Okay. They're doing too much. Yeah. You know? yeah. Because they're such a high level athlete, the stress that they can create is so high that they don't recover from it and they're still training at a volume and frequency that they were when they were intermediate, you know, to new. And, you know, that's I'm a big fan of percentages. Like seventy percent is seventy percent. Yeah, but when you're squatting a thousand it starts going out the window. So when you start getting advanced, when you're talking guys and girls you know, you're pushing 800, 900 pound squats or girls pushing four or 500. Uh, it's, it's different, you know, on what they can handle. So my more advanced athletes, like some of the, the newer athletes, look at them like, oh, man, they don't do much. Yeah, but look what they're pushing. You know, they can't handle that training volume or the frequency, dude, just because of what they're doing. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's definitely real. Right. And you can't just keep stacking more wood on the fire to make a bigger fire. Yeah. Yeah. So. And yet. You can see why if they look at the general population, non-elite people, yeah, I can actually see there's just a linear relationship. More probably is better. Yes. you know. But again, when you get to athletes, 
that's mm-hmm. obviously up to a point. And if I yes. mean, if you're not, if you don't care about your background levels of adrenaline, you know, or some immune depression or that kind of stuff, your performance simply goes down, down if when you do yes. too much. But so. I mean, that said, though, I mean, I could have my elite people do the level of work that these average people do every day, and it wouldn't do anything to them. You know what I'm right. saying? It's not a stimulus. We got to yeah. push. It's not a stimulus. So yeah, we could. And that's when I say training. Like my elite level people, I still want them to do something, like daily. Let's go walk. Let's move around. Let's do this. But that's not even a training stimulus anymore. Or some of them. I mean, let's go in and squat two twenty five for some reps. That's easy work. You know, that's yeah. mobility work. Right. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. because they're squatting nine hundred. <laughs> you know. Right. So, uh, I'm talking actual training. So. Yeah, I mean, it's totally different. And with a new person, we've all seen it. You know, it was awesome being new. You go in and literally you're like stronger the next day because your stimulus, the damage you do, even though you're sore, within two days, it's like you're better and healed and ready to go. Um, And you're in that fun stage where you're gaining pounds a week on the bar. So, right. Because the damage you do is, is so little comparatively. Right. So. As a percentage of your ability, it might be what you need, like a 70 or 80% load. But yeah. yeah, in total gross like damage, it's just not there. You're not strong enough to really do much to yourself. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Joints and tendons are thanking you. Once you get up to heavy, heavy weights, your joints and tendons are like, what the hell are you doing to me? <laughs> right, yeah. So, yep. <clears throat> Mike, you have a variety of clients, I'm guessing. Um how would you respond to a title like no such thing as too much exercise knowing that it's coming from the gen pop you know or or what do you know about the epidemiology of this more activity is better that sort of thing yeah so and the the cool part about the study was it was an epi study and they did pull like a whole you know over a hundred thousand patients and they did track them to mortality right which is considered a hard endpoint you're either alive or dead at the end of the study (laughs) right um but people, I think, misconstrue the word. They did use the word elite in the study, but that's a percentage of the people who are in the group. So they said if you're in this group of people that we're tracking, if you're greater than 97.7 percentile, you're considered elite. You are considered elite for that group, but that doesn't necessarily mean you're an elite athlete per se. So... I think people need to keep that in mind. And yeah, in the study, they did show that the more aerobic training you did, if you're in that higher group, that it definitely had a a major protective um, effect. But again, you're talking, you know, I think the mean age here looks like it was 53, I think. Um, And odds are there's probably not a ton of athletes in this. I pulled the study. It looks like most of the hard data is in the supplements. I wasn't able to see what their VO2 max or, or what they considered elite but they just stratified the group that they had. So in that study, yeah, I think that's probably a fair conclusion. Does that mean you can extrapolate it to elite level athletes or even, you know, barbell strength and power athletes? Well, that's a whole different thing altogether. And I agree with what Phil said, you know, most of the time I'm trying to talk high level athletes out of doing stuff. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm a big fan of, you know, using like an aura ring to look at stuff or using HRV or, some data, especially online, to say that, hey, I'll give you more stuff to do if you can show me that your physiologic response tells me that you can handle it. But if that's going in the wrong direction, if you want to train more, then you're probably going to have to eat more. You're going to probably have to manage your stress. You may have to meditate. You may have to do some other things in order to earn the right to train more because otherwise you're just going to dig yourself a massive hole you're never going to get out of. Yeah. You know, if I can offer an example of this, and Karen, you did set us off, didn't you? Um, <laughs> but Which is, I think when you take a gen pop sample, even if it's yeah. that many people, um, 97th percentile might be being able to squat your body weight or 1.2 times your body weight, right? right? Mm-hmm. I mean, there's not many 50-something-year-olds who are squatting even one and a half times their body weight that would put you in the upper 90th percentiles probably right and that's what you got to keep in mind back to phil's point about there's just not enough total gross damage being done you know um so yeah i think that's where we are with that and i think i think it's probably good advice if you keep it rational and you remember things like population specificity 
Okay. Uh, let's go to break. When we come back, uh, we've got some news on uh, red meat. Uh, and there's almost like this mini uh, news tutorial, if you will, on breakfast. Because I have a bunch of breakfast articles that just happened to fall into my lap. So we'll be back. Can't stop feeling. Some of us don't understand how lucky we are to be living in this. Hi, listeners. This is Rob Fortress Fortney. I'm here to remind you that as the holiday season approaches and your thoughts turn to giving, we like you to keep Iron Rated in your thoughts. Over the past several years, there have been hundreds of listener comments hoping that Iron Radio stays on the air for years to come. Iron Radio is here for you. But as with any public radio type format, the show is listener supported. That's where you come in. For just $4 a month, you become a supporting member, keeping your weekly dose of education, experts, and gym talk flowing. Just go to www.ironradio.org and click on the $4 monthly subscribe button near the bottom of the page. Or click the donate button at the right of the page for a one-time donation. You are the Iron Brotherhood and Sisterhood. Of course, not everyone can afford to be a supporting member or a significant one-time donor. But for those of you willing to pitch in $4 per month or $50 just once, we're about to sweeten the deal. Become a supporting member or major donor between now and January, and a limited number of you will receive a gift worth over $20. And we will never forget our existing supporters. Simply email me via ironradio.org and I'll send you a free seminar from Dr. Lowry on how to significantly and realistically boost your testosterone levels. Help your iron brothers and sisters who cannot pitch in but deserve better internet programming in our sports. And happy holidays. Hey listeners, this is Dr. Lonnie Lowry. If you've ever had anyone critique you uh, on your protein intake as part of your weightlifting lifestyle, oh, you poor meathead, all that extra protein is going to rot your kidneys or weaken your bones or dehydrate you or give you gout or who knows what. Uh, There is a book available. You could simply Google CRC Press and Lowry. And what I've done is reach out to experts all over the world and create a book, a single compendium that you can hold up and say, this is why I consume extra protein. This can be very valuable when you're um, being quote unquote educated uh, by various professionals on the topic. Uh, There's an enormous amount of literature in this book on the safety, uh, the effectiveness, how protein works in cells, the history of protein and weight trainers, uh, much more. So again, please check out CRC Press and Protein and Lowry. You can just Google that, and uh, I do, full disclosure, I do make a small single-digit royalty on the book, but that's not why I did it. I did it so we can all have something, uh, our particular population, uh, to both defend what we do and to inform our nutrition and our eating. Thanks. Iron Radio is, of course, primarily a podcast. But over the years, there have been technical glitches calling for backup streaming and listeners who wanted the convenience of other sources of audio content. Toward this end, Iron Radio is now simulcast and backed up on YouTube. If needed, please search Lawnman07 or Iron Radio from within YouTube. There's not much video, but if you like to listen through YouTube on a Roku or other living room device, there you go. Like your weekly fix of Iron Radio? In addition to being a popular institute on iTunes, we are also on email. Simply go to www.ironradio.org and sign up for the voluntary email. You'll get a once per week email, no more, that's little more than the show notes and a link to the audio. So go for it. All right, folks, we are back with some news. Uh, it's Phil and Mike and Lonnie, and we're going to talk about red meat first. 
Strength and Muscle Sport News. Uh, weeks ago, Phil had mentioned something that was very disturbing to me, and I think to all of us, <laughs> that you can actually become allergic to red meat if you're bitten by, what is it, the Lone Star Tick, I think it was. Mm-hmm. Um, so this paper is related to that. Um, I was talking to a, a, another professor, and we were rolling our eyes a little bit. It just seems like it, this whole like bashing of red meat will just never go away. It's, it's as if we're denying the food chain. You know, but I, I digress. The title here is Red Meat Has Been Linked to Increased Risk of Heart Disease. Here we go. Mm. But uh, um, this was written by Abby Arce, A-R-C-E. Um, anyway, researchers have long suspected that allergens can trigger immune responses that might have an association with plaque buildup and block arteries. So there was a new study that came out um, in the Journal of the American Heart Association, uh, researchers apparently showed for the first time that biomarkers for red meat allergy, and I don't think they mean especially, you know, specifically from a tick. Biomarkers for a red meat allergy are associated with higher levels of arterial plaque. Uh, the main allergen was identified in red meat as galactose A13 galactose, or alpha gal, they're calling it, alpha G A L. Um, it's just a type of sugar. Uh, anyway, um, they say that essentially it triggers a type 2 immune reaction. And I'm not hmm. going to launch into a pathology, you know. Um, <laughs> but there's generally four kinds of hypersensitivity reactions like this. The type 2 are where, you know, your B cells, right, your antibody producing white blood cells, the soldiers of your bloodstream, they release antibodies against an offender, and you know, a non-self allergen like this alpha gal but then they start attaching to you to different parts of your tissues uh so it's like an self autoimmune type thing in in any case they analyzed blood samples from 118 adults they found antibodies to alpha gal in 26 percent of them uh, indicating a sensitivity to red meat Uh, Participants then underwent uh, an intravascular ultrasound to look at the plaque in their arteries, and they indeed, the ones who had this antibody, um, had 30% higher quantity of arterial plaque. Uh, So scientists Hmm. think that the allergens influence the heart uh, through inflammation, so maybe like of the intima, the inner lining of your arteries or the heart itself, something about in, in inflammation, which of course jives with the whole type 2 immunity thing I just discussed. Um, it says it's unclear how many people actually have this allergy. They estimate 1% of the population. Um, but asymptomatic persons could be as, as high as 20% of the population. So they're not having any actual, I don't know what the symptoms of this would be, angina or some kind of, you know, Um, cardiovascular type symptoms but uh, it says interestingly researchers also find that people are sensitized to this allergen via the tick bite so you'll see more of it in the southeastern united states again where you see this lone star tick so they're thinking maybe that the tick sensitizes you uh to this but i don't again my take from this is that they're suggesting this is just a genetic uh, part of the population it's not just in tick induced um Researchers admit more studies are needed. Um, They did look at peanut allergies or allergies to inhalants uh, to see if they could find the same kind of effect, but no such association to cardiovascular disease was noted. Hmm. So, um, Honestly, single-digit percentages for different allergens, like food allergies, that's pretty much on par from what I am familiar with. Um, And when they start talking about unsymptomatic, non-symptomatic, well, okay. Um, (laughs) Okay. So, I, I, I don't know. Mike, do you have any thoughts on this? Yeah, that's the first I've heard of it. So, unfortunately, I don't really have anything else to add. But I, I'm sure people will be running around in fear of red meat now, possibly. But Yeah. They mentioned saturated fat in the red meat. And, you know, of course, that's a much more complicated picture than I think a lot oh, of yeah. dietitians and health educators over the decades have made it sound. Um, yeah, and then here's just yet another, another link. You know, I was watching a Discovery Channel or History Channel thing just just yesterday, and I know this isn't peer reviewed, but they were talking about how some of these blue zones around the world, where people live, you know, over a hundred, there's lots of centenarians. 
they don't eat a lot of red meats. Um, and again, they're always trying to find the link. So I don't know. Maybe there's something to this. Um, I'm curious that they found antibodies to alpha-gal in 26% of their 118 adults. Um, Seems higher than I would think. Yeah, but because later they go on and they say it's estimated to only be 1% of the population. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. I'll have to look into this a little bit uh, further, but it's it's another possible mechanism, right? Insofar that we believe red meat does, in fact, worsen heart disease, maybe it's not the saturated fat. This might explain, if anything, some of the good it might do is, like, you know, take take away some of the load, some of the blame um, from saturated fat. I'm not saying sat fats are benign. I'm just saying maybe there's more than one thing at work here insofar that that's true. Uh, and I doubt any of our listeners who are red meat eaters are going to reduce their intake. So, <laughs> so there's that. Mm. Okay. Um, Interesting. The next bit here is the breakfast stuff. So um, I'll start with uh, the first one from the Journal of Nutrition. This is one of the journals from one of the groups that I am part of that I identify with, um, the American Society of Nutrition. Um, these are high-end journals. It says, cognitive perception of four different breakfast meals influence satiety and related sensations but have little effect on food choices later in the day. This was a randomized crossover trial in healthy men. So essentially what they're saying right here in the title is what you ate for breakfast doesn't have a lot of impact on what you eat later in the day. Uh, so I, I find this interesting. And again, the studies that I'm going to tell you about breakfast go back and forth a little bit. Uh, it says regular breakfast consumption is typically associated with better health status and healthier food intake throughout the rest of the day. So what they did was a crossover controlled trial. They did four experimental conditions. So there were three equal calorie breakfasts, right, isoenergetic breakfasts, in a calorie-free control trial. Uh, the breakfast differed in the glycemic index, right, the speediness of the carbs, usually associated with more refined carbs, um, but also perceived healthiness, palatability, et cetera. Fifteen healthy, normal weight men uh, underwent these different Types of breakfasts uh, with a at least one week washout. So each breakfast was, let's see, random order during four different weeks, separated by one week washout, is what it says. So postprandial satiety, so after the meal set in, so to speak, uh, was similar for the three energy-containing breakfasts. No differences in energy intake were observed for the ad libitum lunch. So they let them eat whatever they wanted for lunch, and there was no differences in how much they ate, uh, regardless of their type of breakfast, You know, regardless of how healthy they thought it was or whether it was high glycemic index or whatnot. Um, it says, whereas prolonged breakfast skipping was compensated for by an increase of about 10% in average calorie intake for the rest of the day. So mm -hmm. uh, we've known for a long time that humans are pretty good eating the same number of calories, a similar number every day. So they're saying if you don't eat them in the morning, you, you tend to make up for them throughout the rest of the day, at least in this study. And again, this, this is a back and forth kind of issue. It says result, resulting in no differences in total energy intake among the breakfast conditions. Conclusions, um, whether the breakfasts were low GI or high GI or they were perceived as healthy, etc., Perceived characteristics for breakfast are of limited importance regarding medium-term <laughs> intake in healthy men. So this is one of those things where for all of the – and we see this with dietary supplements and all this. Just because something seems logical doesn't always mean it's physiological or, in other words, it's hard to tip a healthy person out of homeostasis, right? Their body's going to find a way uh, to equilibrate everything back, back to normal. Um, Mike, does that jive with what you know? Does that go against what you know? What do you think? Yeah, I would say that's pretty much what I've seen because the the studies on breakfast that you've seen too, Lonnie, is that they're they're just all across the board. And same thing, I always think in the back of my head is, hmm, my two questions are, how healthy are these people, and what are they used to doing? <laughs> yeah, you know, if you're pretty darn healthy and you're used to skipping breakfast. 
yeah, they give you breakfast, you're probably going to be okay. Um, now, if you start getting into a quote unquote unhealthy population or a pathology or things of that nature, now we see some stuff kind of go a little, little bit wonky. But my bias is that if you're really healthy and you're, you know, pretty metabolically flexible, that you just switch to a different fuel source and it's probably not going to be a, a huge deal. Um, but if you're not, yeah, it probably gets a little bit more tricky. Or if you're, you know, a super elite athlete and you're trying to get that last 1%, yeah, then stuff like that's probably going to make a, a big difference. Yeah. It looks like their blood markers actually did change after the different meals. But, you know, when the rubber hits the road, it, literally, <laughs> literally at the end of the day, <laughs> um, everything sort of just came out in the wash as far as at least calorie intake. Yeah. And that's uh, what's amazing to me is how – even in a disease state, like how well humans will actually regulate caloric calories in versus out. Yep. You know, you only have to be off by, I think it's like way less than 1% on a daily basis to become, you know, 10, 15 pounds overweight in a year. But as a percentage, that's still really tight. And that's considered someone who's off and not doing great. But it, yep. overall, in the big picture, that's still ridiculously good. Yeah. yeah. This is, um, Alice Rossi, R-O-S-I, and colleagues. Again, Journal of Nutrition just came out. What about breakfast skippers? Phil, do you have breakfast skippers, or do you have people that try to eat breakfast a certain way? Do you emphasize any of that stuff? Uh, well, I have people that will skip breakfast. Like my 5.30 a.m. people, a lot of them will eat because they literally wake up and come right in, and it would probably get messy. Yeah. If, <laughs> yeah. So that's the ones that generally do. Um, but my wife, like, she just does not like eating in the morning never mm. has and so she'll wait till 11 or noon before she eats and that's just the way she seems to work best and we've tried the other and uh i don't know, she tends to feel sluggish and everything else if she wakes up and eats so she's better off than then like you said it all works out man she gets her calories in um we've tracked that and but uh performance wise i mean i mean if i had to choose I would have them eat breakfast, and I would have them train like two hours after breakfast, and this and that. You know, yeah. now we're talking we're talking perfect world stuff, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Most most athletes don't live in a perfect world, so um, people forget that. You know, most especially strength athletes. You know, most strength athletes, even Olympians, have freaking jobs. <laughs> you know. Yeah. So. No, exactly. Yeah, it's it's one thing to say fuel up and go train, but then, yeah. like we were saying, life happens. You know, work yes. happens. Yeah. yeah. Yep. So. To pick the bigger of the two stimulus, training's definitely going to win over did you do it with food before or after. But yeah, and I agree. If, if you can adjust it and get something in before, I think that's probably a little bit better. But if you can't do that, that's not a reason to just not go to the gym. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so. Right, yeah. yeah. And it'll probably change your fuel sources mm -hmm. when you're in the, in the gym, at least on some level or some of the hormonal yeah. responses. But yeah, like, like this study is suggesting, kind of comes out in the wash. Now, this next one um, is a little different. This is um, a Japanese paper in the International Journal of Obesity. Also came out this year. This is just a few months old. But association between skipping breakfast in parents and children uh, with childhood overweight or obesity, a nationwide 10.5-year prospective study in Japan. So they literally they looked at moms and dads that skipped breakfast, uh, and then they saw what happened to their kids' body comp. Um, so the longitudinal association between skipping breakfast in parents and their children and the subsequent risk of childhood obesity is unknown. So we did a 10.5-year follow-up. So they literally tracked – this is a 10-and-a-half-year study. <laughs> like, not kidding. Um, looking at nationally representative samples – a total of 43,663 children aged 1.5 years, so they started when they're babies, uh, and followed until 12 years of age. That was the population. So I know this is kids, but bear with me. It, it, we're, we're trying to get at this breakfast thing. Um, of these thousands, tens of thousands of children uh, that were included, 12% uh, of the mothers and 32% of the fathers usually skipped breakfast. Uh, when the child was a baby at 1.5 years of age, uh, children whose mothers or fathers skipped breakfast were more likely to skip breakfast themselves. That's probably not that surprising 
it could be genetic, but you know, probably also social in a way. Uh, when both parents skipped breakfast, the strongest association was observed. Compared to children who did not skip breakfast, the kids who skipped breakfast had 18 to 116 percent increased risk of obesity. Mm. So it did increase their fatness. Now, that's a huge range, though, 18% to 116%. Yeah. Um, so huge variability, but it did, they are suggesting that if you skip breakfast, at least in your growing years, you're actually going to be fatter. And it may be may, – maybe there is some compensation later in the day like we saw in that last paper. Um, you know, it, it's tough to tease apart. So conclusion – there was a significant association between skipping breakfast in parents and children. Children who skipped breakfast had significantly increased uh, overweight and obesity. So uh, you can see how this can become confusing, right? Because some people, they like almost this intermittent fasting idea. Like I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip breakfast and not eat until late morning or I'm going to skip dinner. They're trying to increase the, the portion of the 24-hour clock that is fasted, you know, but in this one, they're suggesting skipping breakfast, you know, sort of programs you either behaviorally or, or biologically to, to make you fatter. Um, so, again, this is kids, and the last one was in adults. And this is also in Japan, where you're talking about different foods and, and lifestyles and whatnot than most of our listeners. So, And I assume they tried to correct for food quality and other things like that, too, because I'm I often wonder if you're skipping breakfast, are you kind of less conscious of food quality? And I know they always try to correct for those things when they do epi studies. Right, yeah. I just had the abstract in front of me, so the control yeah. variables, I don't know. I mean, obviously, were the parents exercisers or not? You know, right. you have to be very careful because breakfast skipping, and I think this may be one of the answers for us, for our population, breakfast skipping in a gen pop probably means they don't give a damn, you know? Uh, yeah. I mean, it's one thing to, to to get up and have a Jim Morrison breakfast of a, of a, a beer and a cigarette, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and ignore it all together, as opposed to someone who's very consciously extending their period of fasting, and then they're gonna they know that they're on some kind of a diet. So come late morning, they're on they're eating in, in much more healthier patterns, if that makes any sense. So. I think that's one of the things where we have to be careful. How much of this is the simple fact that they skip breakfast? Or like you said, Mike, what are the other lifestyle things? They probably try to control for them, um, but might be hard. And I would think in the gen yeah. pop breakfast skippers, they probably don't have very healthy lifestyle patterns overall. And, and that would be very different from a fitness person who's purposely skipping breakfast. Mm -hmm. Right. So. Yeah. Very cool. They did it over 10 years, though. Wow. Right? So. Yeah. One more, um, and this is just a follow-up. This is actually a, a study that that my group did. Um, this was this is from the FASEB journal from a couple of years ago, though. But um, it's portable breakfast foods, breakfast consumption, and protein intake in collegiate breakfast skippers. So, Mike, you probably remember this, but this was um, Christina Lahr was one of the students, and Tanya Reichert. Uh, was, was oh, on this. Yeah. You know these guys. You know Tanya. Yeah. Yep. So we did a paper where we, um, when students move away from home and into a college setting, so some of our young listeners might be interested in this, um, they're more likely to skip breakfast than when mom was making it and providing it. You know, so like in their, you know, younger years, high school years, what have you, you know, all of a sudden they're responsible for their eating. So the aim of the study was to test the effect of portable breakfast foods. So we actually provided um, an apple, uh, a protein bar. I think we used a Promax bar at the time. Um, but things with some fiber, plenty of protein, stuff like that, we actually handed them out a week's worth of these portable s snacks where, so they could get up, and if they had to run to class or whatever, the hypothesis was that they would actually eat more protein and calories and not skip breakfast because it was handy. It was portable. It was right there. Uh, but contrary to what we hypothesized, there there really wasn't a difference. We compared them, by the way. Uh, we wanted to take the free part, the no-cost part out of it, and we let some people eat for free in the college, in the university cafeteria. So, again, the idea would be that the portable foods, although they're free, would still make it so easy that they'd get more protein and calories. And uh, these were physically active, you know, exercisers, people who were training and whatnot. Um, 
versus ones who had to drag their butts to the cafeteria, basically, to go get the you know cereal uh, and some of the stuff that we provided for free. Um, but yeah, the portability did not change what they ate. It seemed like everybody ate more. So in this intervention, everybody ate more. So, you know, oh, it's free? Okay, Dr. Lowry, I'm going to eat free. So the, the money seemed to matter, but the portability did not. So it didn't affect their protein intake or their calories. And I, I wouldn't have guessed that, right? Uh, it seemed like, well, you get broke college students. Maybe it's yeah. not that surprising. <laughs> Give them a free breakfast, and they don't, they don't care if they have to go to the calf or not to get it. It's free, free is free, and they're going to go get it. So, yeah. College students are motivated by free and food. So Indeed. Yep. <laughs> yeah, but I would have really guessed that if you if they literally had this stuff in their gym bag in their pockets, it would have increased yeah. their intake. Uh, it, and at least in this one, it, it didn't. So, hmm. yeah, that's from the fast Interesting. journal from years ago. But that's that's it. So I I'm sure we thoroughly confused everybody more about breakfast. At least <laughs> <laughs> at least we're trying to give some ideas about how the Gen Pop differs from what we do. You know, and, and some of the underlying factors that, you know, determine whether or not skipping breakfast is is smart for you or or not smart for you, you know. And, uh, and that's all we got. There you go. Cool. Everybody have a good week. All right. All right. See you guys. See you guys. <clears throat> See you later. Hey, listeners, have you seen the store at ironradio.org? There are three halls in the store, one for Phil, one for Fortress, and one for myself, Dr. Lowry, and they're thematic. So you can go into our Halls of Iron store and choose based on your goal. If you need something to learn or read or something nutritional, you can look in my store. Uh, Lonnie's store. If you want something about injury prevention uh, or competition, then take a look at Phil's Hall of Iron. And if you want something about motivation or daily training, Fortress's Hall has what you're looking for. There are some fun heroic descriptors uh, as you browse through the stores. We try to make it a little more fun than the average boring online store. And whether you're a novice lifter or someone more experienced, you can take heart that you're not wasting your time. The things that we put in each hall of iron are actually based on our own recommendations. Protein powders that we know to be good, uh, knee sleeves, wraps of some kind, things that Fortress uses in his own training. Uh, the stuff you, you see, you know is good. This way you don't waste time. So check out the Iron Radio store at ironradio.org and um, let us know what you think on the forums and certainly you can request products and we will uh, screen them before they go in. So thanks for listening. Iron Radio is accepting donations. If you like what we do, the professors, the scientists, the bodybuilding show promoters, the athletes themselves in powerlifting and bodybuilding. Um, please consider making a donation or maybe buying something from the ironradio.org uh, store. Uh, we also are accepting supporting members. So for $4 a month, which is frankly less than the bank sneaks out of your account in fees, you can step up and support a form of sort of public radio for the bodybuilding and powerlifting and strength community. The Iron Radio Podcast and all of the audio on ironradio.org is for informational purposes only. If you're interested in starting a diet or exercise program, it's important to check with your physician. Also seek the help of registered dietitians, athletic trainers, and qualified exercise physiologists in order to make the progress that you need.